God has specifically chosen you to be here at this time and in this place. You have incredible potential, purpose, and calling to push back the darkness and be a light for Christ. Stand for nothing and you'll fall for anything. It's time to stand your ground. This is Unapologetic. Hey everyone, welcome to Unapologetic. I'm so excited to have my friend Ainsley Earhart with us today. She is going to be telling us about her brand new children's book, I'm So Glad You Were Born. And I cannot wait to talk to her about this great book. And then also we're going to be discussing what it's like to be a parent in today's world and culture with everything going on. But ultimately, no matter how scary or fearful it may be, uh, it's a wonderful privilege and it's a wonderful honor to be able to raise the next generation. So please welcome Ainsley with me. Hi, Hi Ainsley. <laughs> Thank you. It's so good to talk to you again. Thank you so much. I know. I'm so glad you're on and I'm so excited about your book. But before that, we're going to start with a question that we ask everyone. What right. do you wish Christians would stop apologizing for? Oh, yes, because we're on unapologetic. Uh, let's yes. see. <laughs> I would say, um, you know, the world can make you feel like you shouldn't talk about your faith or you shouldn't talk about Jesus. And I don't apologize for that because he is the reason I exist. And I know that that's my mission and that's why he has me on Fox News. Yeah. And Fox has always allowed me to talk about my faith. They've never told me I can't. And it's really cool to be in New York City working for a network and able to talk about Jesus on air. And we accept, you know, they, they would accept anyone talking about their faith, no matter what their faith is. But for me, I have a personal relationship with Jesus and I wear the cross on air sometimes. And um, I wore it this morning, actually, during the morning show. Yeah. And I am just so grateful that God has put me in this position to be bold and to stand up for him only because I love him and I love his children. And um, yeah. I have the opportunity to wake up America with a positive message and yeah to remind them that they are loved too by Jesus and this world is not it. This world brings problems and sorrow and hardships, lots of beauty and lots of blessings as well. But this is not it. If you have a hole in your heart, like I did at one point in my life, Jesus Christ can fill that. And I mean that sincerely because he did fill that heart hole for me. And I was about 21 years old when that happened. And I never turned back. And my life has just been so wonderful since. And of course, we we have situations that are not ideal and we are going to go through pain and we're going to have hurt and things that we don't understand. But uh, we have the peace of Jesus and the peace passes all understanding, surpasses all understanding. And so we might not understand why things happen to us, but he will give us peace that will surpass that, that will surpass our disbelief, our not understanding, our questions of why, if you have him in your heart. Okay. I'm going to change what I told you we were talking about. You're like, oh, this is fantastic. Um, but with that answer, I was just immediately thinking about, I know so many, we were, of course, work in student ministry with young adults. I know so many people interested in going into acting, going into news, or at the other end of it, just at least like posting on social media. Right. I. Could you give advice? Because I, I see a lot of people that think they need to compromise. Like if they want to make it in show business, if they want to be in news, if they want to be an author, if they want to be, you know, go viral or get verified online, like they need to compromise maybe their modesty or beliefs, or maybe they should just kind of hide that they're a Christian, not openly advertise it. And so obviously you've had a different experience, like God has honored you being open about your faith. But can you just give girls specifically advice that are interested in news, interested in TV and media, and who are believers? You know, you bring up an excellent question because I wanted to be an actress growing up. I wanted to live in New York City. I wanted to walk the red carpet at the Oscars. And I was so fascinated with their lives and took so many acting classes. I loved it. And I knew God created me to do something in that field and in that realm. And then when I got saved, I started, I, my parents wouldn't pay for me to major in theater. So I took a lot of acting classes on the side in college. I took acting and was very involved in theater growing up. And then when I changed my major from biology, I decided I'm going to be an, an orthodontist because I had worked for an orthodontist throughout high school, a wonderful man. And I'm still friends with the Boyds. I used to babysit for them. And then Dr. Boyd asked me to, to work for him. 
And he said, I'll pay for your college. If you, I'll pay for your dental school, if you take over my practice and I'll teach you everything you need to know. So I thought, oh, this is wonderful. In the middle of college, I called him and I'm like, Dr. Boyd, this is not, I just know God's pulling me in a different direction. And God was really working on me like Mm -hmm. end of my sophomore year, beginning of my junior year in college. Mm -hmm. I transferred universities to South Carolina and majored in broadcasting. And so it's funny that you say that because that junior year, that's when my life changed Mm -hmm. and I became a really strong Christian, no telling what I would have done if I had pursued acting and made it to New York. My parents were always fearful of that. They're like, we're not going to support that. You can do that later in life if you decide, but that's just not what we're going to pay for. Right. So, um, I ended up in broadcasting and throughout my studies at the University of South Carolina, I realized this is what God created me to do. I mean, I was making straight A's and was, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm not being boastful. I'm saying God gave me this, but right. God's, I su- excelled in that, you know, in that major. And I loved broadcasting. I loved telling stories. I loved being the first to crime scenes and the first to, you know, um, accidents and wrecks or whatever, so that I could help. But be there and report what was happening. Mm -hmm. And I was just always fascinated with that. And actually my little girl is fascinated with all of that too. And she wants to know if someone has a surgery, what happened? Can I watch the surgery online? Can I see? She's very curious. And I was the same way. And so it's funny that once my life changed, God took me away from acting and put me into broadcasting. So I was still Mm -hmm. in television, still able to live in New York City Mm -hmm. and all my dreams came true. And I am so grateful. I I would never want to be an actress anymore, but growing up, I did. Mm -hmm. And so it's funny how God steered me in a different direction, maybe to keep me out of the trouble that comes with sometimes the Hollywood story, but still allowed me to be on TV and in New York. So I'm grateful for that. My advice is follow your heart, find out, figure out what your passion is, because God gave you that passion Mm -hmm. and whatever it is, follow it and be a Christian. You know, just Mm -hmm. be be as righteous as possible. And a pastor Mm -hmm. told me one time, anytime you see righteousness in the Bible, convert that to do the right thing. Always Mm -hmm. be righteous. Always do the right thing. Mm -hmm. And if you have to turn down roles that you're not happy with or you feel like are not right with God, then so be it. Mm -hmm. God will bless you in other ways. I promise you, you turn down that that movie that was going to offer you fifty thousand dollars and God will give you another role that's worth double that. And if not more. And I've seen Mm -hmm. that in my own life. So Mm -hmm. just, we all fall off the wagon. Sometimes we do things that we're not proud of. We are all sinners and that's why we need the Lord. Mm -hmm. We're all on this journey together and we can't be judgmental of one another. We have to support each other and pray for each other, Mm -hmm. but um, you'll figure it out. Follow God, number one, be on his path, be on his road, follow his, I, I imagine him walking in front of me and his robe is in front of me and I'm standing right at the end of his robe, trying to catch Mm -hmm. up with him. And he's going forward and he's leading me in that direction. So if you follow him, you'll be fine. That is a fantastic picture. Like what a neat, neat picture. I know I always, I just tell the girls like, you're not going to miss out by obeying God. It's not going to, somehow you're going to miss out on what the world has or what God has for you. Um, Okay. So let's just switch gears real quick because we're talking about, of course, your new book. And we talked beforehand a little bit. I just think it's so awesome. I see God do this all the time with authors and movies that come out where he knew what was going to happen in the world. We didn't, and we created something way before it happened. And that's what I thought of when I saw the title of your book, I'm So Glad You Were Born. Of course, you wrote this before Roe v. Wade was overturned. So Mm -hmm. can you just kind of talk about how amazing that is, that this message is about to be out in the world, that our parents usually are so glad we're born, but of course, God is so glad that we were born. You know, God's timing is impeccable. And when all of this came down and I reread the book, when I got the first copy in my hands, I was just in awe about how God does this. Um, It's a touchy topic. It's a topic that, um, you know, I love everybody and I I love the women that have gone through that. And my heart breaks for them Mm -hmm. if they are still in distress or still grieving Mm -hmm. their loss. I had a miscarriage and I grieve that child, but without that, I wouldn't have Hayden because she Mm -hmm. was born three, she was conceived three, three months after my miscarriage. Mm -hmm. So I knew I wanted a baby and I knew I wanted to try to, to get pregnant again. And, um, 
we immediately started trying after we lost our first child. And um, I know I'll have her in heaven. And I know that Hayden has a sister up there and we'll all be together. This this life is like this. Yeah. You know, it's it seems so hard and it breaks my heart when I hear people that can't get through it and they commit suicide. And we all know mm-hmm. someone who has. And that that's just awful mm-hmm. because maybe they're me- dealing with a mental illness or, or whatever they're dealing with. You have to be in order to get to that point, I would imagine. But, um, you know, it's just such a quick little life. And we have mm-hmm. eternity, which is forever, forever in glory and no pain and no yeah. suffering. And our little babies are up there. And, and, you know, I imagine them all playing together and will greet us at the pearly gates with Jesus. Mm-hmm. Wow. But um, whatever you're going through... This is really a book just to remind all children, adults, children, it's great for a birthday or it's great for a baby shower, that God has a purpose and a plan for your life. And we are so glad that you're here. I mean, as a mom, and Julia, you know, as a mom, when you walk on the streets and you see another little child or you walk in a restaurant and there's a little girl that walks in with, you know, and she's crying or giving her her parents a fit and the parents are so stressed there's a little giggle in all of us because we've been there and we know that, Mm -hmm. but I can't look at a child without just loving that child and Mm -hmm. seeing the possibilities and the glory in God Mm -hmm. in these children's faces because they are so innocent and they're so Mm -hmm. sweet. And us as parents, we get to raise them. What a Mm -hmm. gift, what a gift to see our children see things for the first time and learn to read. I remember so terrified. How am I going to do homework? I'm terrified of first grade. I haven't even thought of that. Um, yeah, it's, we have it's, to do homework all over it's again. <laughs> but Julia, when your child gets it and starts yeah. learning sight words, and then you read mm-hmm. books together, and and your girls will be able to pronounce the words, you're like, this is amazing. Right. This is going to be a lot of work, but it is mm-hmm. worth it. And this is amazing that my little girl mm-hmm. is reading. Mm-hmm. You know, it's you see the transformations. You see it, in, you know, in their ages. Mm -hmm. And it's just the coolest experience. And Mm -hmm. I am so grateful. I I would have loved to have had a a lot of children. Um, But, and I don't know how you do it, Julia, but (laughs) I am, I am so grateful to even be blessed with one child. Absolutely. I was kind of thinking about, I mean, of course, most moms have read probably like a thousand books by the time their kids are what, two, but I, some, some children's books are kind of like, I mean, let's just be real. They're like, Oh man, this is not, this is not my favorite thing. But then you have those books that really they're sweet and they're of course written for children, but they really challenge you as a parent Mm -hmm. and that's, and just encourage you. And that's what I think of with this book. Of course, most of us would not ever say, I wish you were not born, but it's a good reminder of just what a precious gift it is. I'm so glad you're born. I'm so glad you're here. Cause of course there are difficult times where that's not on the forefront of your memory or of your thoughts. I was also thinking about a lot of teachers that are going, of course, back to school. And I have a lot of teachers that work in um, lower income schools, and they really see being a teacher as a ministry. Would this be a book for the classroom for teachers? Because teachers get to step in a lot of times as parents and say, I'm so glad you're here and maybe encourage the kid and things that they don't get at home or messages they don't get at home. You know, my mom was a school teacher for 33 years, and she taught in... um, a lower income classroom and or school and she loved it. And those children were so beautiful and precious. Mm -hmm. And she saw it as a ministry too, that this was a Mm -hmm. way that I can love on these children. And some of them had some tough stories that she would share with us. So Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm really praying over this book that it doesn't only get into the hands of moms and dads who have a lot of time to spend with their children, but also into the hands of children that might have parents that don't read to them every night or mm-hmm. parents that are screaming and yelling, or parents that mm-hmm. are super stressed, and mm-hmm. the mom has worked all day. They may or may not have a dad in the home, and mm-hmm. she has to cook dinner for her family, and she might have four kids. Talk about stress, and they need to do homework, but she doesn't have time to do that, and maybe they're falling behind in school. I want those children to know that they are so loved. And in order yeah. for those kids to hear this message, these books need to be in the classrooms, because right. these are some of these families can't afford books or won't be mm-hmm. buying books for for their kids. Mm-hmm. But this book teaches you, you can be a preacher, a baker, and there's a, a line in there, an electric car maker. You can do whatever you want, 
but enjoy your life and have fun and find your passion. And, you know, my first two children's books were very lyrical and Hayden was a baby. And Mm -hmm. when I wrote the first one, she wasn't even born yet. She, I was pregnant. And so this one is so much fun. It is, I want, I told the publishers, I said, this book, I wanted them to, I want this book to be happy because Mm -hmm. my home is happy. And there's no screaming, no yelling in my house. There is no stress in my house. Uh, occasionally, I guess there might be when I have to put her to bed and she will not go to bed. I was going to say, there's no stress in your house. Can you, you really, write a book on yeah, that? I only have one child. <laughs> yeah. and I'm, and I'm a single mom. I'm a single mom and I have wow. one child. So That's amazing. My, it's Hayden and Ainsley against the world. You know, so she's my buddy. <laughs> and amazing. we talk about Christ. We are very mm-hmm. open with each other. We have a rule. There are no secrets. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I'm raising a little girl, so there are no secrets. And if anyone yeah. says something or does anything to her, I need to know immediately. And but I don't even I don't even know if she'd ever be in that position because I'm with her all the time. Mm-hmm. And um, I mean, I guess they always that's always a possibility. But I pray over mm-hmm. her. We talk mm-hmm. about Christ. Um, she's already saved. She already accepted Christ into oh, her that's heart. That's amazing. Five, yes. And I'm mm-hmm. in my bedroom out on Long Island, and my bed's over there. And she was sleeping with me, and she she was like her head was back here on the pillow, and she said, "Mama, I think I'm ready to accept Jesus into my oh heart." Oh my gosh! And she that's did, and then I got my phone and I recorded. I said, "What'd you say again?" <laughs> <laughs> Mama, I'm embarrassed. Yeah. I don't want to say it, oh. but I'll keep that forever. Yeah, mm-hmm. so we just have a lot of fun together. We have dance parties. I have a big Tupperware container yeah. full of instruments, and we roll it out into the kitchen. And if she wants to get paint out and she wants to paint on the dining room table, mm-hmm. you know, I try to put a blanket down first or some mm-hmm. newspaper down first and then let her paint. But mm-hmm. it's not a big deal. If she spills her milk, it's not the end of the world. Yeah. You know, it was an accident. Mm-hmm. So just things are different in our generation. Mm-hmm. And, you know, my dad will mm-hmm. roll his eyes and say, gosh, y'all don't discipline like we did. And y'all, <laughs> and, but she's a really good child. I mean, time mm-hmm. out is the extent of a discipline, and we haven't mm-hmm. had to do that in a while. But yeah. I just, um, she's my happy place. I just oh, love, I love hearing you mom. talk about her. I just I want to point out something you said because I, I, in a lot of conversations about this with moms that kind of wonder about if a child's too young to accept Christ. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I made that decision when I was four and a half, like really wow. understood, really accepted Christ. And you're saying Hayden was five. So mm-hmm. just for our moms listening, I want to encourage you, if you have a child that's interested in salvation, go ahead and explain it. Yes. Go ahead. I mean, the Bible says not to keep kids from coming to Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> like that's the summary. Yeah. Um, so go ahead and explain it. Go ahead and pray with them. Let mm-hmm. them make that decision. Um, because really, uh, most kids, it's 80% accept Christ before the age of 15. So that's that a very, right? yeah, it's a very yeah. known statistic. Something yeah, happens once it. you get into the later teens. As I guess yeah. we do all kind of know that. But um, it's important to let little kids accept Christ mm-hmm. and make that decision if they want to. Um, I We are pressed for time. I can't believe it. Ainsley, can you tell us how to stay connected with Yes, with you, you and when the book comes out and how we can sure. get it, help you get it out into the world because people really need to hear this. I'm glad you. you were born. Thank you. I'm so glad you were born. And you know, I was Googling it the other day and I was um, putting into one of the, the search engines mm-hmm. and I forgot, I, I put in I'm, but uh-huh. my brother said, I can't find it on air. I mean, online. And I said, what'd you type in? And he said, I am. I said, no, 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 it's I'm. There's a contraction oh, okay. in there, Trent. But, um, and yeah, I'm so, so glad, glad you were born. Okay. I'm so glad you were born. And this is the picture that reminds me of Hayden. This is why we made it the cover. Because Hayden says, there I am. There, she's a little blonde girl. And she says, there I am. And, you know, here we are beating the beating the drums loudly and blowing the brass horn. I'm yeah. so glad you were born. So we're just Love celebrating it. lives. Um, it's just a really cute book. I'm proud of this book. My mom always said this to us when we were growing up and my mom had a stroke four and a half years ago. Mm. And she, she was just, she, you can't, she's hard to understand. She can't talk as well. But when I Mm -hmm. told her I was doing this, she said, Oh, Oh, and you know, tears came down her eyes. So I'm really proud of this book. I'm proud of my dad for, um, sticking by my mom through all of this. They've just, she's been through a lot. She had diabetes and then, um, She's on dialysis three times a week and then the stroke, and she's the strongest Mm. woman I know, and she's doing great, and her faith is strong, Mm. so I know where she's going eventually, and um, this book is dedicated to her. But thank you for your support. You can reserve your copy now on any, you know, book site, wherever you buy your books, and um, it comes out on September 27th. 
Julia, Amazing. thank you so much. God yes, bless you. thank you so much for being on. <laughs> yes, thanks. Well, we will definitely have, we'll have to have three copies, but we will definitely be reading your book and mm-hmm. helping get the message out. So thank you so much for being on. Thanks for having me. Bye. Wasn't that an uplifting word from Ainsley? I just love how clearly she loves being a mom. And I know that I'm so glad you were born. We'll just be ministering to so many children and their families for years to come. So we're going to switch gears a little bit here because there's something I love to do on my social media accounts where I ask questions and get to answer them on social. But we haven't really done that on this show yet. And so this is going to be the first time we do that. I am going to be answering answering some questions that I've received from the audience through social media. And I think the topic we're going to do today because of our conversation with Ainsley is specifically how we can encourage teachers, how we can encourage teachers and moms during this beginning of the school year, which is not at all stressful, right? Not at all. (laughs) So we have some really good questions that people wrote in and I'm just going to read them for you and we're going to talk about them because of being a minister and a therapist, whenever I answer questions, I do a Bible verse. I give a Bible verse that gives us biblical wisdom and then also just give some practical counseling advice. So that's going to be the format. Let's look at the first question. The first question says, how can teachers, oh, this is good. How can teachers view what they do every day as a ministry, even if they're in public school where they can't talk about Jesus openly? How would you challenge or encourage them to share the gospel? How are, this is so good. How are teachers changing our kids lives for Christ okay fantastic so just to know my background and um, both my grandmothers were teachers in the public school system my mom was a teacher in public school I went to public school That's where I met Ryan. My parents went to public school. That's where they met. We're all junior high sweet. That was going to sound weird, but Ryan and I are junior high sweethearts. My mom and dad are junior high sweethearts. Um, Being in public school really formed my faith. I 100% understand that things are different now, and I understand why more people are choosing homeschool or private school with everything that's going on in culture. So I get it. But I do want to just talk for a minute about what it's really like to be a Christian in public school and what it's like to know that your teacher who is in public school is a believer. Um, Whenever you're in school as a Christian and it's not a Christian school, because you have the Holy Spirit, I really believe this, like you are drawn to other Christians because you're in the battlefield. Like you need people that are going to encourage you. And I can't tell you what it was like for me as a child to want to witness to one of my friends that wasn't saved, to want to invite my friends to church and be nervous. Like we've all been nervous, right? Before someone, before you invite someone to church, we're nervous. And I would go to school and I would be nervous to invite that friend. And then I would see a teacher that I knew was a Christian. And it just gives you an extra little encouragement. It reminds you that you're not on your own. And so whenever we're talking about like, should people go to public school? Should they go to private school? I just can't help but think about what it was like for me as a little girl if I hadn't had any Christian teachers that I could look up in their class and know, okay, like they were coming from the same place. I know that they love God. There are without a doubt challenges, of course, in public school. But I just wanted to tell you, there are fantastic ministries. There are fantastic stories that happen there. And it's not really true, um, just from this question, that teachers can't talk about God in school. I, I couldn't even tell you all the all the stories that I hear from teachers who they're like, this is the hill that I will die on. I am going to talk about God. I am going to make sure that that's woven into our classroom. And of course, like if you end up, losing your job over that. I mean, we know that God provides and that it's never wrong to do the right thing. But I know many teachers who are doing that well. They're they're being able to still have influence in the public school um, and still 
talk about God and talk about Christian ideas um, whenever they're able. And so just realizing you know, what's going to happen? What's going to happen to society if all the Christians leave the public sector, if all the Christians leave public school? And I know there are scary things going on, but I also know that there are devoted Christians who are staying. They're staying to teach. They're staying to lead. They're staying to be um, representatives of the gospel. And on a side note, if you're wondering, I know this question was more about how can teachers know that it's a ministry? You're with those kids like 40 hours a week. And some of those kids, even even if you're not getting to actually explain how to become a Christian, you are God, they're seeing Jesus in you. If you have the Holy Spirit, they can't help but know that something's different. And it's so amazing. I believe when you ask God, please open the door. Please open a door to a conversation or help them to see that there's something special here. You have no idea how you're encouraging that child. And so I just want to thank you. If you're a teacher and you're, you've gone through COVID and you've chosen to stay. um, I I know my teacher friends say it's just been very hard these past few years, but you have a student that's excited to see you. You could be the one that makes that difference in their lives. And even, even if it's not specifically leading them to Christ, I mean, they could just know, hey, Miss So-and-so, I know she likes me. I know she's for me. I know she smiles when she sees me. And that could give that child the strength just to go on and keep going in the direction of one day accepting Christ. And then also I would say... um, you're doing the Great Commission. I mean, there is one thing that we're left here to do. We're supposed to go into all the world and tell them about Christ. And teaching is one of the best ways, the most amazing ways that you can do that. So I know it's hard, but thank you, especially thank you to the teachers that are staying. And it's a hard culture right now. So thank you for investing in our kids' lives. Let's do the next question. Okay. Oh, this is funny. I should have read this ahead of time. So how would you encourage, it's not funny, it's just because of the triplet factor, but how would you encourage the mom who's maybe overwhelmed with all the fall activities and the new routine of going back to school? Hmm. Okay. Uh, What scripture or biblical truth should she cling to in this season? And how can she rely on God Uh, when she can't do it all. Okay, well, you can't do it all, right? And I know something that's happened with us because of course of our unique situation. Um, There are so many things. There are so many things that they can be involved in, that they can sign, sign up for. And maybe there are a lot of things your kids really are good at. And I think we can get, you get overwhelmed when you feel like you're not in control. And then, of course, people are like, you're not in control. God's in control. And you're like, okay, all right. So what, I mean, how can we actually sift through this? The truth is, as a parent, you're in control of your household. Even when it feels like you can't say no, you can still say no. And so whenever, for us, whenever things start feeling really off track, we take a step back, we sit down and talk. And this is funny, but this is an exercise I learned as a therapist you step back and you say, okay, if I could have it my way, like if, if my life was going to look like what I wanted it to look like, if this fall was going to look like what I wanted it to look like, and there were no rules or obligations with anyone else, what would I want it to look like? And maybe that looks like, I don't want to have any games on Saturdays, or I want to make sure that we have Thursday night, whatever night. Just take all the obligations out to figure out what you and your husband want as a family. And then you start piecing, putting things back in. And you can do that at any point in time. That was something we did a lot during COVID. And you can do it during any season. But during COVID, we'd say, okay, if this were not going on right now and the whole world were, were open, what would we wish we could be doing? And then you make a plan to get as close to that as possible. And so just realizing with over being overwhelmed, uh, you're in control as an adult to, to a very large extent. Um, there are things that you can change. And then biblically speaking, The Bible says we're supposed to be still. We're supposed to be still and know that God is God, right? And 
that's important for us as moms to have times where we're still and we can just check in and we can feel God's presence and not be stressed out. But I've really started realizing it's really important to set times for your kids to be still. Like when can they be still and calm down and just be? And so that's a practical rhythm to start in your family and um, making sure Saturdays are not days of just recreation. We are supposed to have rest. I've seen a lot of families, unfortunately, where they just drive themselves crazy on Saturdays and then they rest. They choose their rest day to be Sunday morning and not go to church. And so I know that it's hard, especially if you have athletic children, but making sure that those Sundays, Sundays are God's day and that y'all are in church on Sunday. So that actually making a schedule, figuring out what you want for your family and realizing to a huge extent, you are in charge, even if it doesn't seem that way, you can always change things. Okay. We're going to do one more. I think there are a lot of questions. John keep sending these in. These are good. Okay. Interesting. Okay. So how can we let our kids go out into the world without being so fearful? The world and schools can be a scary place for our kids right now. How do we trust in God and know that he'll protect them and provide for them? Okay. So this, that's, it's so good. And it's true. I just want to say some practical things your kids don't need to know everything going on in the world. They don't need to know every bad thing in the news. They don't need to know every scary thing. Those conversations where maybe we're scared of something as a parent or we're worried about it, we just have to remember that the kids are always listening. And so make sure you're having those conversations with your spouse or your parent or your friend where the kids can't hear. We don't need to add to their stress. Of course, they pick up on all kinds of things, um, but we, we need to do our part to make sure that we're able to protect them. And it's not so that they live in some la-la land, but it is so that they, for the most part, can feel safe. That was something we learned um, in graduate school, that kids need to know that basically they're okay and they need to have a sense of calmness. And of course, that's difficult to do, even if you have a great home. Loves y'all love God. You're doing everything right, so so to speak. If you have that constant anxiety in your household, it it's pretty much without fail. You end up with anxious kids. And so, first of all, handling that in your own life. And if you need to see a counselor to help with anxiety, maybe you need to do that. But I know I just had a friend that I talked to and she just needed to talk through how, how do I know um, basically that, that all of my kids' days um, are numbered, that God has a plan for them. And she was just calmed by scripture, by scripture that we pointed to, that God has ordained all of our uh, numbers, all of the days of our life. And whatever it is in your life that you need to deal with, fear, anxiety, handling that, and it's amazing, amazing how much that calms your children down. But if you really do have an especially fearful child, I just want to guard against, because I see this happen all the time, where parents are like, oh, it's okay, don't be scared, like, be brave. That's dismissing their feelings. And it's not that all feelings are something that is necessarily true, but it is something that they're experiencing. And so explaining away fear, like, don't you know God's with you, or don't you know I'll be here at four o'clock, that's not super helpful. Like we do need to allow them to feel. And when they're fearful, tell, ask them, like, what are you scared of? And the best thing you can do is then you mirror that. You say, oh man, that makes me sad that you're scared about that. Or that would make me scared too. Having those feeling, that feeling language helps you bond with your kid. So you empathize first, and then once you have that bond, once you've talked on that level, then you talk about 
the truth and practical steps. So it would be, oh man, like that scares, that would scare me too, or that makes me sad you're going through that and letting them process it and then developing a plan instead of automatically correcting um, the fear or wrong thoughts. So those are the questions that we have for today. I love answering your questions. We're going to add this into the show periodically. So please keep sending me your questions. I would love answering them from a biblical and psychological perspective. And remember that you can hear today's episode and more at ptv.org Julia and wherever you get your podcasts.